So I understand that there is a lot of folks that are caught up in, you know, inside the thing, the traffic. So that then means we have to have this here train rolling anyway, because the food is about to get cold. So can't have 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 that. Uh, so anyway, my my type of what job is going to be very very simple. Uh, and I'm going to spend as little time up here as possible because no one is here to have me heard. They are here to hear these guys heard, and that's who that you're hearing about a, in a minute. But what I kind of want to do is to have, have what certain, certain people who have been absolutely invaluable to us uh, what's it, recognize. Uh, so I see, you know, and this is why I wish it wanted you guys who's way over there, Brad, so I can barely even have you seen. As a, so, so, so I am going to have him told, Brad, why don't you stand up? Uh, Brad, Brad up there used, used to, in fact, to work at which is Citizens, <laughs> Citizens Bank, but he took himself a, uh, what's it, the upgrade, and now he runs a fun company called Launch Trampoline. And I mean the kids, kids, Brad, so all of you guys, there goes, there goes the guys, all you guys are talking about Launch, Launch Trampoline. There he is over there. <laughs> uh, but then I want, want to also, in fact, which acknowledge there are people here who have had us gave which is support from the, which is the city side. Uh, Mr. In fact, was it Tom? In fact, was it Men and Men and Cello? So over there, and he has been in type of avid, the avid, in fact, su support of the program. Uh, we probably would not even be around if not for him. Uh, he is that there important, and Tom, we really, really, in fact, appreciate you. Uh, beside him is that lovely, lovely young young lady. Uh, in fact, with state, in fact, rep, in fact, Claire, Claire, in fact, with Cronin. Uh, you, you guys have seen, seen her at our competitions. She is always there. The kids call her and says, you know, Representative Cronin, we need you. And she is always there. She's been one of our largest, what's it, the advocate. Her and her guy beside Ms. Ms. Mr. Cassidy, rep, Representative what's it, Cassidy. Uh, so when that, you guys are out there to vote, uh, you know, think about the people who come out and have you gave support such as, you know, these here type of fine, fine people. Uh, and do I, do I see the type of the, the principal of with Brockton High? Oh my God, it, it's Miss Walters. <laughs> you have to belong up here. You got to sit up here. All right. Uh, and then I want to thank that my board, who has been really absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, Jennifer, in fact, with the dueling, takes, <laughs> takes my calls day and night, as well as Dr. Dr. Fred and Brad. So uh, is uh, with Jennifer dueling around here? Where is she? There she, there she is, <laughs> Citizens, Citizens Bank. So she was the one who had us gave the wonderful idea about the kids, she's always talking about what I can do in terms of t of the kids. Uh, I just think I have the best best with the board around. They're so so active, very very helpful. You you guys will hear uh, which later on for our keynote. In fact, speaker doc doctor. In fact, which is Fred, who has been my which mentor for years. I have learned a lot of what I've learned off of him. Uh, he has been a type of a wonderful which mentor to me as well as. Uh, with the others. Uh, we also have some people here from which, uh, and also uh, Scott is here. Scott, in fact, was, in fact, was it Stevenson from uh, Eastern Bank. There goes the Eastern Bank, bank people over there. Uh, Eastern was our very, very first person who had faith in us. And when that no one else would have us gave, Eastern, Eastern, Eastern Bank came up and said, you know, you guys are it, and, you know, which we got your back. And that there was, in fact, the guy, my very, very first, and he has been absolutely wonderful. So whenever you hear people talking about what, what bankers are bad, they're not talking about these bankers. They're not talking about these, these, these here bankers. They're talking about some, some other bankers. And 
we have the Raytheon, Raytheon table here. Uh, when that we had kind of what, the, in fact, the site is, is out. There goes Mr. Alfonso. For, um, hopefully, I'm not messing up your name. Him is and his party of Raytheon. So Raytheon will be having our Saturday morning, uh, in fact, the engineering program. So let me just tell you this: that which is the MIT, they teach their type with, uh, with the, in fact, the type of freshmen how to build up with his solar cars. He is going to be having that taught to our kids. So our kids are going to learn it at an early age. We're doing it with middle school every single which is Saturday, along with him and the, in fact, the Nesby, Nes, Nes, Nesby kids, so that which we have to can to have our kids gave a wonderful, wonderful which is start. Thank you, Al. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and then we, we have the wonderful, which the, in fact, with Dr. In fact, with the Brooks, who is, Margaret has been my type of partner in crime for a long, long time. And she, uh, she is one of Bridge, Bridge, in fact, Water State is only one of seven, in fact, schools in the country that has itself a program for, in fact, which literacy. So keep in mind, this is something that most, most people never even teach. And she has been kind of with us all the way along with the Mass Mass with Council. Um, and over here at my very type of special table was Bentley. And hi, Amy. Hi, <laughs> oh my God, the love affair is on. <laughs> so, you know, Bentley, when I came to them five or six years ago and said, you know what, I said to Miss with, with Claudette, stand up Claudette, she's been wonderful. And I said to her, I would like to have that my kids learn just, just how to trade. And she said, well, what age are your kids? I said, well, well you know, middle school. She said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You want to bring a bunch of 11-year-olds into a live trading room? Are you crazy? And I said, no, I'm not crazy, but I do want you to do it. And they said, absolutely not. And then I kept, in fact, was right at them until I reached, reached her. And she said, bring them in. <laughs> she said, bring them in. And we have been, been having kids, kids there every year and since this here year, for the very first time, we are going to have, in fact, you know, in fact, four of our kids at the Wichita, at, right at it, they're at the very, very exclusive camp that uh, was a business, which is 101 camp. We are, we are going to have, um, uh, in fact, that our kids there, uh, and it's going to be a wonderful, ex in fact, experience. So where is our type of kids that's going to be at the Bentley, Bent Bentley camp? Where are they? Mike sitting over there. So they are going to be experiencing the Bentley, Bentley camp. Uh, so they are going to be hanging out with all the wizards, big, big wigs. Lastly, we, we have ourselves some people here from New, New, New in fact, what? Dennis, Dennis, in fact, which is Cleary, uh, is, is up here from, in fact, with the Black, Black Wall, Wall Street. Uh, and we are going to have ourselves a wonderful, wonderful thing with them, collaboration, because I have always been trying to, you know, my thing is the competitions, the competitions, the kids love them. And so I always said, gee, man, if we had competitions in New York, uh, that would be absolutely wonderful. And he happened to have 300 schools down there under him. So I'm like, okay, so Miss, Miss Wilson Walters, we have ourselves some competition here, all right? So, uh, in fact, I know that which Dr. In fact, Fred's going to talk about you which later, but I just wanted to have you on, which they introduced. So that is my, my time. Uh, is uh, Loic, Loic here? Where is Loic? Here? Oh, there he is over there. So we are going to have uh, some of our kids give you five whole minutes. Oh, I, well, the first, first one is Loic. He's a 2011 grad of what to do, Brockton High. Um, he 
just now received his which is degree from which in Boston. Boston, in fact, was a college. I call him a which a doctor, but he claims he's not. Uh, he's he is about to be a CEO of a very very large company that he'll which we'll talk about. Uh, Loic is one of our alumni, one of our lovely. So I just I thought that you guys should kind of like hear what what our type of kids can go, was it really really do. So I want to bring up with Loic. <laughs> Hold on, Loic, stay here. Uh, so since I kind of know this is my last last time I am going to speak this here evening, I would be absolutely remiss. If I did not introduce my was partner in crime, one of my teachers, Peter was Zimbo, who just came in from the Ashfield. Peter is absolutely awesome. Uh, he has done a wonderful job, in fact, in terms of us. And my type of um, the inspiration, the guy who calls me up at five o'clock every single morning and gives me my was the inspiration every day, Mr. Jim, in fact, was it Garrity from over in Morgan, in fact, was it Stanley? Uh, Jim is now the, Jim is now the kind of the finance, was it, was it minister for the, the Massachusetts, was it, was it Democratic Party. Uh, so all you cats running for, for office. Uh, and then he, he is also now the, was it, the managing, in fact, was a partner of, um, was it Morgan. And he always calls me and his conversation is the same. Was Cedric, man, the kids, man, what are we about to do? He has spent his life when he really and kind of would do not have to. There, there are a lot of people inside this room who do not have to spend any time with kids. Money wise, they're all set. Career wise, they're all set. They don't really need to, in fact, it would be here. And you know, Jim is was one of those, those there guys. And I absolutely would love him. He's been a, a, thing, a great, great friend, a great, great with you. Mentor to me. Jim, take a bow, my friend. <laughs> and on that dead note, I'm going to have you gave us a blow it. Okay. Um, looks like I'm standing between you guys and dinner, so I'll make it quick. Um, so I'm Loic. I'm a nurse practitioner as well as um, an entrepreneur. And I sit on the board of a company called Century Blue, which just acquired, um, which had acquired a, uh, an app that I had developed as an undergrad in high school, in college. Um, today I wanna share with you about um, when I first met with Mr. T, uh, Mr. Turner, but we called him Mr. T at the time. I was in high school um, and Within a few weeks of meeting him, he asked me a question that I believe changed my life. And I'm going to share with you what that question is. But before I do that, I want to share with you a little bit about my personal past. So I was born in Cameroon. For those of you who don't know where that is, that's on the central western coast of Africa, right below Nigeria. At the age of six years old, my family had to move to the USA because my mom had gotten sick. And because of how things are set up in Cameroon, we lived in an area where we had no hospitals. So it took us about two or three days to get the amount of money that we needed to get her to a hospital. And during those two or three days, nobody knew what exactly my mom had, and nobody was able to do anything to care for her. When we finally got to a hospital, it was overcrowded and it was inefficient. Thank God my family got the opportunity to travel to the USA, um, where we got really good care for my mom. And I think today she's doing a lot better. But growing up, I felt two things. One, I felt sad because of the fact that my brothers, me and my three brothers, and my mom and my dad, had to pack up and leave. And we left family members, we left friends, just so that one person in our household could get health care. The other thing I felt was I felt guilty. I felt guilty about the fact that I know that this type of thing wasn't unique to us. I know that there are several families out there in Africa who experience the same things that my family experienced, but not everybody has the opportunity to come to the U.S. for, he for health care. So growing up, I told myself I would become a health provider and help improve conditions in Africa so that other people wouldn't have to experience what my family experienced. 
But growing up in a family that had not gotten their education in the US, there wasn't really that much help that my parents could get me. My dad told me the way to succeed is to do good in school. And so throughout grade school, I did really great. I took all the challenging classes, and I had pretty good grades. So by the time I got to high school, I was a straight A student, and I was in mostly honors classes. And I think it was my sophomore year when I met Mr. T. And I think this is the part where I share with you the question that he asked me. Within a few weeks of having met me, Mr. T asked me, what makes you different? What makes you different? And at the time, I was so proud of the fact that I was achieving well academically. And so I said, I'm a straight A student, and I'm in all honors classes. And he asked again, what makes you different? And I thought to myself, why is he asking me the same question when I just answered it? And so it wasn't until I spoke to Michael later on that I found out that even at Brockton High, there were several other students who were also all honors in all honors classes and who also had all A's. And we spoke about it, and then I found out that even in the whole United States, there were several other students who had straight A's and who were also in honors classes. And so I started to think, what would make a college accept me over another student who had the same qualifications as me? And so that's when I really understood what he meant by what makes you different. And so throughout high school, we learned about entrepreneurship, we learned about economics, we learned about the contributions of African Americans in the fields of science, technology, and engineering. And oftentimes, um, at the time, Ms. Walder actually was my headmaster at Brockton High. And oftentimes, I was getting the entrepreneurship piece from Mr. T and all our mentors, but I was also getting a lot of academic support from my housemaster, Ms. Walder, who was also supporting and encouraging us to participate in this program. And so by the time I graduated high school, the question came again, what makes you different? And so when I was applying for college, I was able to put in the fact that not only was I a straight A student who was in all honors classes and AP classes, but as a high school student, I had learned about entrepreneurship, I had learned about running companies, and I had done all these great things through the program. And so thank God I got into Boston College, and um, that wasn't the end of it. So my sophomore year in college, I looked around, and I asked myself the same question that Mr. T had asked me. This is something that stuck with me. What makes you different? And so I looked around. I was part of a group of students who was a bio major who was doing pretty well. But I looked around. There were several other students who were doing the same thing. And so at this point, I had learned about entrepreneurship. And I had also had my experience growing up in Cameroon. And so my sophomore year in college, I decided to use those experiences. And I decided to develop a nonprofit organization called the Global Enterprise for Medical Advancement. And my mission was simple, help improve conditions in Africa so that other people would not experience the same thing that my family had experienced when I grew up. And so I was able to get a lot of funding from Boston College, and I was able to travel to Cameroon and Ghana and even Ireland. And I was able to work with local communities within these countries and help create um, global health, uh, public health, public health um, service, public service announcement, ex excuse me. Um, and so the goal was basically to improve education so that Africans living in remote rural areas would be able to understand um, about the top diseases in Africa. When I had come back from those trips, I decided I wanted to push the envelope. I wanted to move things further. That's when I decided to develop a mobile health application focused on improving health conditions for people that experience the same thing that my mom had experienced. And the goal of the application was basically to allow people living in remote rural areas without a hospital to get access to health content when they get sick. Because my mom had gotten sick, nobody knew what she had, and it took us two to three days to get her to a hospital. And so I wanted to create a tool to help people in that same situation. And I was able to work on that app because I had a lot of mentorship from Mr. T. And eventually, I won several business competitions, both at Boston College and in Brockton. But eventually, I was nominated as the Young Entrepreneur of the Year from the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council. <laughs> so
So that is when I met Dr. Fred, and Dr. Fred was the personification of who I wanted to be like when I grew up, because he was an African-American male who was an entrepreneur, and he was running this company, and I looked at him and I said, wow, this is the person that I want to be when I grow up. And he not only opened his arms up to me, and he, he was able to provide me with a lot of mentorship about around my app, around the company I had was developing, and I felt so grateful for it. In addition to that, I had also met um, Jim Garrity through uh, Mr. Turner. And one of the things that he did for me, which I will never forget, I think he may have forgotten, but I will never forget this time. When I was planning my first trip to Africa to work on my app, he invited me down to his office down in Boston. And I walked in, I told him the goals that I had, the vision that I had, and he listened, he offered a lot of advice, and at the end of the meeting, he signed the check for me to help support my trip. And I remember walking out of his office and thinking, wow, I'm a college student. I have never done this before. I have a goal and I have a vision. And this man just supported me both financially and gave me a lot of um, words of encouragement. And so by the time I had graduated my undergrad, um, not only was I working, had I developed this app, but I had also met a company in Boston called Century Blue, which wanted to acquire my app. And so I licensed the app to this company. And by the time I was graduating college, again, I heard Mr. T's voice in my head, what makes you different? And so I looked around and I was surrounded by several students who um, were smart and intelligent and brilliant and who had their bachelors from Boston College. But I told myself, in order to achieve what I wanted to achieve, I really needed my master's. And so I decided to go back to Boston College to get my master's as a nurse. And here I am, two years later, as a nurse practitioner, serving on the board of this company who had acquired my app when I was just um, an undergrad. And I think that all of this was possible because of the one question that Mr. T had asked me, what makes you different? And I think that this question, although it sounds simple, it really got me to think about what I, what I valued and um, what I really wanted to achieve in life. And I think this program, Empower Yourself, does exactly what, it, what the name says. It empowered me. Nobody pushed me to go into entrepreneurship. Nobody pushed me to go into nursing. Actually, the program empowered me to really understand what my values were and to really pursue my goals. And so I'm standing here today because, remember earlier I told you I felt guilty because I, my family had moved from Africa to come to the USA, and I knew that several other families didn't get the opportunity that we did? I often, when I feel, when I come back to Brockton um, on vacations and so forth from school, I look around and I look at other students that I graduated with, but not all of them are always in the same position I am. And so I often feel guilty of the fact that I was able to get be, become part of this program. I was able to meet people like Dr. Fred and uh, Mr. Garrity, and all these people were able to provide me with a mentorship to get me to where I am today. And so I really, I'm standing here today because I really want to do my part and help support other youth and other people so that they can eventually achieve their goals in life and be where I am today. And so I think I would just leave on this note. Um, I noticed I spoke to a lot of the, the high school students um, in the program um, when we were setting up, and I would just like to leave you guys with a challenge. And the challenge is simple. It's the same question that Mr. T had asked me, and that is, what makes you different? Thank you. Hello, good evening again. I would like to just take a moment and thank everybody for being here and thank the good, patient people of Massasoit who are going to begin inviting us to the buffet um, by table. So uh, my name is Mary Ellen Cobbs, and I fell in love with this work um, at the John F. Kennedy Library at the Global Symposium. Um, and I'm starting to learn about these uh, young men and women, and I'm blown away uh, at the opportunity and at the access which we know transforms lives. So thank you for being here. It's an honor to be here with you and to be acquainted with Mr. Turner and his organization um, and to have such state and local leadership here as well. It means an awful lot. So we are going to have uh, some of our kids, kids talk to, talk to you. 
And uh, in, inside the, the organization, we have ourselves a, uh, the organization chart. And uh, we operate off of that there type of chart just like any other company. And so right right now, I'm going to have you gotten the type of uh, the, 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 the head person right on that chart, uh, which is Mr. Abdul Khan. So Abdul is going to, uh, if I were talk, and then he's going to have, have some of his type of the, the, the type of comrades talk. And uh, he is going to have you gave the, the overview of the, the, organi the organization. So keep on eating, refills, and, and terms of everybody. And the auction, silent auction thing. So make, make sure that you guys look at the items, especially the picture of which you're Muhammad Ali. All right. Okay, Abdul. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Abdul. I am the president of Empower Yourself and I'm here to share my story, so let's begin. My experience in Empower Yourself was amazing. The amount of time in Empower Yourself I had stayed was about now two years and the amount of work and time I have done with my group was amazing. Man, two years now and I am the president of Empower Yourself, now in front of about 100 people speaking. This shows how important the effects of Empower Yourself all my classmates and me had. Like before, I joined Empower, Empower Yourself. I was a complete foolish kid who would think uh, GPA 3.5 will bring you to all these big colleges such as Harvard. Coming from a background that is from the Middle East, it has been hard to be exposed to the real world and understand it. Like before, I, um, like before, I was not able to tell people my emotions and stories, how Muslims are affected and uh, how Muslims are widely affected. I would want to help those who are in need. I would want to share my story where uh, one of my close friends named Ahman had came from Syria. He is a normal six-year-old kid where he found himself in a home which was attacked by a drone. He had lost all of his family members, like his sisters, brothers, and mothers. The reason why I would want to share the stories to other students and help them understand you are the next potential person to help others such as Ahmed or help the world. This will be the next race for me with Empower, so this could be the start of the race towards your goals and you would want to reach. I cannot believe I had accomplished my dreams, which was to influence others and be a public figure. With the help of Empower Yourself, I am able to create connections with fantastic people like from Tesla or Raytheon or everybody who's, who's here today. I am telling you right now, others in Brockton are, are not usually introduced into finance and economics. Like when I was in my ceramics class, uh, there was these seniors who, would, who didn't really understand the value of investing. And I spread the word and show them how to invest in these type of factors. And their eyes just start to pop open, right open. You, you see them all in shock. They're like, how do you make $24 million? Uh, I want to give a shout out to Young Investor Society. Um, <laughs> Currently, I make $24 million. I wish I had it in my bank account, but sadly, I don't. Uh, hopefully, a loan company. <laughs> um, uh, and I show them how the laws of investing can affect the way you can run the market sometimes, and how you can start from there and make your own company. And um, I want to give a huge shout out to Mrs. Wilder, who had helped us when we were in struggle, when we were succeeding, and when we were stalled. I cannot believe how she had helped us. Without her, we would not be able to help win the competition. We would not be here representing Empower Yourself in a strong gratitude. Without her, we would not be able to get the space that is needed for Empower Yourself. Can we have a round of applause for Ms. Wooley? So I also want to give uh, huge shout outs to Cedric Turner. Uh, Peter Zimbor. Tinara, Nate Shaver, and Jill Donald. Thank you, guys. I want to uh, introduce one of my fellow classmates, who is now currently the president of Young Investor Society, Michael Anoro. Hi, how you guys doing? <laughs> All right, so 
I would like to start by thanking Mr. Turner, Ms. Amy Whitaker, our principal, Ms. Wolder, and everyone else who has donated or contributed to the opportunities my classmates and I have received. We all greatly appreciate everything that you have done for us. I personally have been with the program since sixth grade. I remember walking into our first ever financial literacy class and picking up a practice test and on the front page it read nickname with a blank space next to it. I wrote Mr. Turner Jr. <laughs> and ever since that day at any event, he introduces me as Mr. Turner Jr. <laughs> However, there have been many times where I didn't show up for class for weeks and Mr. Turner was on the verge of kicking me out of the club. I wasn't just ignoring the class though. I was either caught up at work, football, or going through some of my own problems at home. Despite this, throughout the past six years, I have competed in almost all of the competitions. Through all of this, I have learned a few really important lessons for life. The first being that consistency is essential. Whether it is in the workplace, a sport, school, etc., being consistent and showing that you are trying and giving it your all pays off. The second is that communication is also crucial. If there is something that you cannot attend and you have a valid reason, if you just say something, then the other person will often understand. One of, if not the most important lessons I have learned is opportunity cost. And Mr. Turner has emphasized this, these two words ever since the day I have met him. And it is something I have experienced through football. Sometimes you have to give up one potential gain to take a different course. I love playing football, however, however I was not going to make it to the NFL. I realized that I had greater odds achieving a career in business one day, so ultimately, I had to make a hard decision. Football or empower yourself. As we can all see today, I chose empower yourself. The most simple lesson I learned is that everyone makes mistakes. As long as you get up and show that you have learned from your mistake, you have made progress, and there's nothing wrong with that. I've made ma many mistakes in empower yourself and throughout life. There have been some rough times where I was hanging out with the wrong people and doing things I probably should not have been doing. I figured, hey, I'm 15 years old and I have a job and there's all these other kids out here that aren't working and having fun, so why shouldn't I? But that's not the way I should have been thinking. I realized that hard work now really does pay off in the future. I am not saying that kids cannot have fun, but there are ways to balance work and fun. And there's a point where you have to stop and think to yourself, what do I want in life? And you cannot accomplish these things by going out, partying, drinking, smoking, and running around the streets of Brockton. It is a vicious cycle that many kids, many intelligent, talented, and athletic kids get caught up in. I don't want to get too off track, but for example, my best friend for the last seven years was recently arrested. If he had stayed on the right track, he could have really been successful in life. Not saying he can't now, but he had made it, uh, he just made it a lot harder for himself. I used to be with him every day, but I began to distance myself and focus on better things. I put that behind me, and around the beginning of this year, I started to ask myself that same question I just mentioned. What do I want from life? And that certainly is not to be in a jail cell or working at McDonald's for the rest of my life. That is when I began to push myself to stay on the right track in school and be consistent in showing up to empower yourself. Like I said before, consistency pays off. And I have seen that happen for me this year with Young Investor Society. When we started YIS at the beginning of this year, we learned about the stock market and that really caught my interest. Then Mr. Turner told us that we would have to pick a stock and pitch our stock to judges at the end of May for the state championship. So we all began working. Before we knew it, the competition was a week away and we were spending every day after school to try and perfect our presentations and our papers. I ended up winning the competition, which was not how I thought that day would end, but this was a first step. After the competition, James Fletcher, the head of YIS, approached me and told me I would now qualify to compete in the global stock pitch competition that would be held in little over a week after that. Immediately we got back to work trying to fix all the mistakes I had made the first time around. During my presentation, uh, during my preparation, I sent my pitch in PowerPoint to the wonderful Amy Whitaker, <laughs> which she then sent to Rob and another student, and they helped me a lot. 
Unfortunately, I didn't win the global competition, but I did finish in top five out of 900 participants. <laughs> Although it was technically a one-person team for the state competition, I could not have done it without the help of my classmates in YIS who were so supportive, even though we were all competing against each other. They were a tremendous help, and this was not just a win for me, but a win for us as a whole. I also couldn't have done it without the help of Mr. Turner and his son, Michael Turner, and especially without the help of Amy and her students. This coming year, I will officially be a senior, and thanks to all those who have guided me during my six years within the program, I now have a clearer path going forward. There is no other program like Empower Yourself, and I think oftentimes we forget why it is, why it is called Empower Yourself. This is a group of ambitious students who want a better future for themselves and the people around them. My goal is to eventually go to Bentley University and major in finance. I want to either be a financial advisor or do something to help people with their money so I can give back like many have to us. I want to spread this program to help kids like ourselves find a true interest and stay focused on the right path. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, now I would like to this I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the superintendent of Brockton Public Schools, Kathleen Smith. Good evening, everyone. This is a wonderful occasion, certainly, for a superintendent of schools to hear the wonderful things that our students from Brockton High School have shared with you this evening. Please give them another round of applause for what they have done. I have to tell you, when first coming on board four years ago as superintendent, one of the first people I was introduced to was Cedric Turner. He was a cheerleader. He was enthusiastic. He believed in our students, and he was everything that a superintendent would want. Somebody that was going to take those students to another level, certainly never leave them behind, and do everything he could to make sure that he shared with our students what financial literacy really is. On a selfish note, I have to tell you one of the first events I went to and spoke at as superintendent was an event that had uh, Ron Burton there. And those of you that know Ron Burton, I am a big Red Sox fan, and I loved being able to see his World Series ring and to share in the support that he had for our students in the many programs that Empower Yourselves gives to the students in the Brockton Public Schools. I had another opportunity to witness these programs firsthand, to get into the schools, to see the content going on, the after-school support, and those of you that know what makes our children become young adults and successful is that we provide a safe place, caring adults, people that believe in them, and opportunities for them to succeed. And that is just what Empower Yourself does. I do want to thank, when I look out at our principals, at our teachers, that make sure that this is a program they continue to tell the superintendent and the school committee that no matter how difficult things get, this is a worthwhile program that is one of those life-changing, make a difference in a kid's life, and is something that we must, we must continue to support. I thank those community organizations and the businesses out there that, again, continue to say to our students that you matter, that we are here for you, and we're going to see this through. We need to have these partners, especially during this time, and I'm going to tell you this. I am banking on these students helping us to get through a difficult time. Some of them could share their financial wisdom. We have ahead of us a lot of advocacy work to make sure that the Brockton Public Schools, and let me say this to each and every one of you, you have a level one high school. That is the best in the state, unheard of, with 4,300 students in a large urban high school. Thank you to Principal Wolder, 
Thank you to all the teachers, and thank you, most importantly, to all of the students out there. I say this everywhere I go, that you make me the proudest superintendent in this state. And I'd be remiss if I also didn't mention, tonight we have a, a couple of members of our legislative delegation. We have Representative Claire Cronin, Representative Jerry Cassidy, who continue to support all of these endeavors with a lot of hard work. I've been right beside them. I've seen what they've done. So please, a round of applause for them. And you do have a school committee man in the audience. So I've worked with Tom Minicello for many, many years. He is vice chairman of our school committee. And the one thing that I will tell you, I've watched his heart. I've watched how he cares about your children. And you couldn't have a better representative of what it means to be a champion for our students in the Brockton community. So thank you again, Mr. Minicello. So I'm so glad everybody has come out this evening to support this wonderful event and to see everything that our students have to offer to our community, not only at this point in their lives, but I think all of you will attest to the fact that this is our future, and our future is in wonderful financial hands. Thank you very much. Seems like an elite start. <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gilson Salami. I'm the president of our Brockton Scientific Nest Virginia chapter. Our chapter is one of only two within Massachusetts and was made possible through the efforts of both Mr. Turner and Empire Yourself. Nesby is a not society of black engineers, and in the goal of this organization is to empower young people from young ages, even starting from, from, starting from young ages to even college and beyond, to become the engineers of the future. Nesby isn't uh, a group where you, listen, you follow a list of things that the na national gives you to do, but rather a, a collection of groups where they try to improve themselves as well as, well as others. Uh, we, of our, we of the chapter create our own projects and goals to improve ourselves and find the career paths that we always should go into. I have to give thanks to Raytheon, which has helped us greatly in our, in our endeavors by holding a Saturday morning class, supporting us in our summer camp, and helping us forge relations with Harvard, MIT, and WPI. <laughs> to be <a laughs> yeah. stop for them. To be honest, at first our group didn't have the best of starts because we mostly were, not, were unfamiliar with engineering or nor how to start a group like this. Um, but as the year went on, we managed to grow and garner some achievements. One of such achievements was our recognition by the Brockton School Committee and the Mayor's Office for our design of a 24-hour all-inclusive park. We presented this idea to both the Mayor and the School Committee, and the Mayor intends to um, incorporate some, if not all, aspects of, the, of our, our design into two to three parks around Brockton. Though we have this achievement on our list, I can't say I led this entirely. I'm not the best person to lead a group quickly, and I, I take some more time to think about things than compared to my fellow leaders, but I feel the, this experience helped me greatly. Both being an empire yourself since the seventh grade and becoming the president of Nesby has changed me greatly. <coughs> to be honest, my bad at this. I'm on, I honestly will not speak in front of a group, like, group of people like this normally, nor try to um, lead a brand new organization. But, being, but this opportunity came from being an empire yourself. And I think that this group was and still is very uh, essential in my life. I can't say I really ever had too much hardship throughout my life, other than like, I used to be yeah, made fun of doing my last name. But at the time, I didn't really think about it. It didn't really affect me. But I noticed later in life that I kind of I suck at understanding people and having courage to move relationships forward. Through all the people in Empire Yourself, I've gotten much better at it, and even though I'm still a bit shaky. Before, if I came to an event like this, I'd probably be the guy standing in the back on his phone wondering why I'm still here because I don't know anyone. <laughs> Though I'm kind of still that person, I feel that I've grown much from that quiet guy in the corner. I'd also like to thank Ms. Walder for all the help she's given us through within the school and her support of us. She helped me in leading the group by giving me advice one day after school. That day I cried because uh, 
it's not often that I actually get generally compliment, complimented, and that day I felt that I actually could lead our group through the as we just uh, we just started. I only have thanks for all the opportunities that sprung forth for me and empower yourself, and through the efforts of Mr. Turner and all those who have supported us all these years. Thank you. Alright, so wh what do y'all think? <laughs> so, uh, right, right now we're about to have you guys eat and talk and digest. And don't forget the auction, silent auction, very, very important. Um, so there are some which people here who, I, who had just now came in, uh, with Dr. Irvin, in fact, with, in fact you know, Scott is here from uh, which the, the Harvard. And the reason I, reason I kind of was, in fact, was to mention it is because we will all be there on the, uh, what's the, uh, 20th. And they have us gave that the preferential type of, re, re type of what's recruiting. And we have the red, red, what's the carpet, in fact, what's it rolled out. And this is what, what happens when you have some awesome kids. And so it has been a real, real type of joy in terms of me to have them served. And now we got people like what's Bentley over here and Harvard University over there and uh, Bridge, Bridgewater State and MIT. So these are our next future corporate and global what's it, leaders. So right, right now, take that plenty of which pictures with them because you'll see. That is the kid from the Brockton High who just won the, the Nobel Prize in science or engineering or in, in art. So this is what where that was the, where at where at now. So we are going to take a f few minutes, and then after that we are going to have our uh, in fact keynote keynote person speak. Uh, but in start to mean meantime, enjoy the food and the silent auction. Enjoy it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's a great honor uh, this evening to be joined by Brockton's mayor, Mayor Bill Carpenter. Um, among other contributions to the Brockton Public Schools, one that is of particular importance in recognition to us was he was among the original school committee members to bring Empower Yourself uh, to the committee and for consideration. Uh, and for that, we're very, very grateful. Uh, Mayor Carpenter is indeed a true champion of Brockton's children. He's raised his children and some grandchildren here as well. I know you would never tell by looking at him. Um, and he's, <laughs> he's also a very uh, dear friend to myself, my family, and to the city of Brockton. Mayor Carpenter. I'll be very brief. I know we're waiting for our uh, keynote speaker. He just broke the microphone. All right. I'll hold up my hand. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I'm a little bit of a late arrival, uh, but this program is so important to uh, young people growing up here in the city. And I know that. Uh, the superintendents here and Tom Minichello, I remember when Tom and I were serving on the school committee together and we supported uh, when Cedric first brought the proposal for Empower Yourself um, because we know what financial literacy means to cities like Brockton. And we know what it takes to help families break the cycle of poverty. And we know what some of the tools and skills are that we need to give young adults growing up here in the city for them to truly be able to take advantage of the opportunities we're trying to provide for them. And financial literacy skills are essential. And to see uh, just in a few years what Cedric's done with this program, the way he's built support in the business community for what he's doing, and having had a chance to uh, meet some of the uh, young adults that have come through the Empower Yourself program is just uh, really impressive. So uh, we are going to figure out a way to uh, continue this program because we know that it's critical 
uh, for young people growing up here in the city uh, to have the opportunity to participate and empower yourself and to really gain uh, the financial literacy and skills and job skills building and all the different tools uh, that Cedric and his team are helping our young adults to develop. So it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, in support and uh, to be part of the program. So thank you very much for having us. I look forward to the main speaker. I just want to take a moment that in case no one, in case I haven't shaken everyone's hand here yet, my name is Michael Turner. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yes, I am the younger, more ambitious clone of Cedric Turner. <laughs> and if there's one thing I've ever learned about public speaking from my lifetime of being forced into it, is that you never want to follow up the person who is the best speaker at an event. Which isn't to say that any of the people speaking haven't been great, they have been, but I find it a lot better to introduce our keynote speaker than to have to speak after him. So I've had the actual pleasure of working for Dr. Fred McKinney twice, so he didn't have to bribe me the second time, so that worked out really well. But um, I had the pleasure of working for him while he was the director and president of the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council, and I also had the pleasure to work with him as the um, current director for Minority Business Enterprises at Dartmouth College. And what more can you say about a person who is probably one of the most staunch advocates for minority business and economic empowerment and one of the overall best mentors I've ever had in terms of both interacting with people and in terms of life experience. So with great pleasure, I would like to introduce my mentor, Dr. Fred McKinney. I'm going to, can you hear me? Oh, this is just for the camera? Oh, these are the ones that work. Okay. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you for, for being here tonight and supporting Empower Yourself. And uh, I've really prepared some remarks and some slides, um, primarily for the young people in the room, but it looks like all the young people have left. <laughs> so, no, not all of them, but there's some of them here. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, history, uh, the present, and the future. Um, and I also want to talk about my relationship to this uh, wonderful organization. Uh, I was reminiscing a little while ago with uh, Mrs. Turner. And, you know, Cedric, you're going to be in trouble because you did not recognize your wife this evening yet. Is, and uh, what's that? Evening's not over. Okay, well, you, you have a chance to redeem yourself, young man. Um, but I was reminiscing with uh, Mrs. Turner a little while ago about the, some of the fun times that Cedric and, and when Michael was a young man of about eight or nine years old, we went skiing together. And, and this, is what, this was with our minority business owners, and I would say that most of the people in the, on this ski trip, and there were about 50 of us, had never skied before. So you can imagine uh, what, that, what that was like. But uh, that really was the start of a great relationship with Cedric, the Turners, and Michael. And I feel very fortunate to have had Michael on my staff twice. Uh, and I wish he was still on my staff, to be, to be honest with you. So um, I, in, in, I wanted to talk about history because I, I really believe that the work that Empower Yourself is doing with these young people uh, is, has the potential to make history, that the kids in this group uh, can literally make history. Um, and they have that potential because I've seen it. Uh, I've participated with Empower Yourselves in the competitions that they have uh, competed in. Um, and you could tell, I mean, this, I remember one event that was held maybe three years ago uh, at uh, the Patriot Stadium. And how many of you were there? So some of you were there, some of the students here were there, and there must have been 60, 70 schools from around the country. Um, schools that had 
unlimited resources, it seems. Um, schools that uh, had prepared their students perhaps for, for years for this event. Schools who the, the students had parents and uh, folks in their family who uh, financial literacy was, it was, an, was expected. It was something that these kids grew up with. Um, and there was empower yourself. They, were, they stood out. They stood out in many ways. Uh, one, they were the most diverse group at this whole, at this whole event. But two, they had it, and this was what was most important, and I think this is what struck me uh, in my relationship with Empower Yourself. Uh, these kids have been exposed and been trained to behave, to act, and to perform with excellence. And you know, this is not something that just happens. This comes from, from leadership and vision. And for that, I want to congratulate Cedric Turner uh, for having the vision and the leadership to really have the influence on these kids that, again, makes it possible for them to be great. So I think you should give Cedric a round of applause. And uh, you know, I feel like I've received some, some really undeserved compliments from two of the speakers tonight, from Loic, um, who you know, I, I really thank him for his kind words. Um, you know, when you, when you hear these things, it's, it's almost surprising because I'm just doing my job. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. And when a young man, and it's been several years now, since uh, he was awarded the Young Entrepreneur of the Year in the organization that I formerly led. Um, and it was a no-brainer. Here was a young man who had a dream, had a vision, was dedicated to that dream and vision, had the support in organizations like Empower Yourself to accomplish that dream and vision, and at such a young age. So I see great things there. I also see great things with Michael. You know, and I'm, I'm a little biased because I, I hired Michael as an intern first. And I remember Cedric, you know, Cedric has a way that, and you guys are shaking your head, I see his wife smiling back there. <laughs> Cedric has a way that, uh, it really is unique. Uh, when he calls, sometimes I almost like, oh my God, Cedric is calling. Because I know that there's going to be something that Cedric wants, but it's going to be something that is absolutely appropriate. And has, it has to, I've got to be able to figure out some way to make it happen. And so, you know, and it, it happens all the time, because Cedric, we talk often. And um, I, I think I need to go get another job. <laughs> because, but anyway, Cedric called. And I remember when he told me about Empower Yourself's start. And um, so I was a little confused because Cedric also had a business that was certified in my organization, the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council. He was in the insurance business and in financial services. I think it was called Universal Benefits. Am I right? And Universal Benefits was an outstanding minority business in the greater Boston area. He, you know, one thing about Cedric, uh, the personalities don't change. Sometimes the activities change, but he was the same then as he is today in Empower Yourself and engaging and in, in motivating, and he had a very successful business. And when he called me to tell me that he was going to open a nonprofit, uh, called Empower Yourself. I was running the, the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council at the time. And um, I had heard, you know, I'd, I'd worked in the nonprofit space for a number of years by that time. And um, I wanted to learn a little bit more about what he was doing, but I was prepared 
this time. You have to kind of steal yourself when you're going to meet with Cedric because, you know, at least you don't, if you know you're going to lose in the end, but you might as well, you know, make it hard for him to, <laughs> to do something. So I had him come down to my office. I was at, at Copley at that time. My office was at Copley Square. And he came in. And well, the other great thing about Cedric is he's tell, he tells wonderful stories. So, and he comes prepared. And so he knew that you know, he was going to have to come with his A game to me. And so what he did was he had cut out an article um, in some newspaper, some magazine. And that was his prop. And he, it, was a new, it was an article that showed a, a tennis shoe, a basketball sneaker. And he said, Dr. Fred, you wouldn't believe how much this basketball sneaker costs. I said, uh, I thought we were going to talk about your nonprofit. He said, no, I'm going to get to that. But this basketball sneaker costs $1,300. And it was uh, a Nike, if I recall. A limited edition Nike for $1,300. And he said, Fred, the kids in Boston and Roxbury and Cambridge and in Brockton, are beating each other up to try to get these tennis shoes. And for what? A tennis shoe. When if they took that $1,300, Dr. Fred, they could start a savings account. They could start a business. But instead, they're beating each other up, stealing shoes off people's feet on buses for tennis shoes. He said, Fred, we got to do something about it. I said, OK. That's the bait. <laughs> I say, OK, what's next? And so he says, well, I got a plan. I said, we're going to take some young people in Cambridge and in Brockton and in Roxbury, and we're going to train them in financial literacy. And to let them know the term opportunity cost. I'm an economist by training. That's one of our fundamental concepts, opportunity cost that there's an opportunity cost to those shoes. And they need to know a little bit about economics. And they need to know that there are choices that they have to make and can make and must make if they're going to be successful in life. And this organization is designed to help them make better decisions. Now, um, you know, I, I, I really believe that you can transform lives. Uh, I really believe that because I've seen uh, my own life transformed. Uh, I was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Uh, my, my mother and father picked cotton. Now, yes, I have a PhD from Yale. And you know what happens with young people, they say, oh, PhD for Yale. You always had a PhD for Yale. No, I did not always have a PhD for Yale. Now, my mother and father didn't always pick cotton. They were smart enough to get out of Arkansas. But I know that education and the support and love that can be given to young people can transform their lives. And I know that history is important. Because I really believe, and I'll say it again, that if you're going to make history, you've got to know history. And so when Cedric told me that Black Wall Street was going to be here, I said, I need to incorporate that in some of my remarks. Because it, the story, you know, many people don't know the, uh, the history of what's called Black Wall Street. And while I'm an economist, I'm also sort of an amateur historian. And I want to tell a little history story, because I think it's relevant to the kids today. Again, you must know history to make history. And so I'm going to take you back and to a time in uh, this country's history when it wasn't like today. It wasn't very good for black folks in this country. And, um, and it wasn't very good for a lot of folks in this country. 
And many may know a little bit about this history, but I want to share some, fill in some of the blanks for you. Because it really is a multicultural history of Black Wall Street. And I want to start with a little, a little bit about the, the Native American population, because that's part of the Black Wall Street story. You may have heard of the Trail of Tears. How many of you have heard of the Trail of Tears? So what happened with the Trail of Tears were Native Americans from Georgia, the Seminoles from Florida, the Choctaw from Mississippi, the Cherokee from Alabama. They were forced out of those southern states. And where did they go? They went to Indian Territory. And what state was Indi what state became Indian Territory? Or what, what, what did Indian Territory become? It became Oklahoma. So if you look at, even today, if you look at the Oklahoma state flag, it is a flag with a feather and an Indian emblem on it. That was Indian Territory. And so the Cherokees, the Choctaws, the Chickasees, the Seminoles, they, were, they moved. They were forced out of the Deep South before the Civil War. After the Civil War, when blacks were freed, many of those black folks decided that they wanted to leave too, for good reason. <laughs> and many of them looked, and they knew the Seminoles, they knew the Cherokees, they knew the Chickasaws. They decided, well, they went to Oklahoma. So a large group of blacks from Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, and, 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 and Florida got on their horses, and many of them walked from Mississippi to Oklahoma. And if you look fast forward to the early part of the 20th century, these black folks had moved to what became Tulsa, and a section of Tulsa called Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And in Greenwood, in 1915, the black folks in Greenwood, Oklahoma, controlled, because of segregation, a part of the city that was 36 square blocks. Okay, That's not an insignificant size. 36 square blocks with tens of thousands of black former slaves and former slaves' children moved to tennis to Oklahoma. They opened hotels. They opened barbershops. They opened grocery stores. They had a hospital. They had two newspapers. They had funeral homes. They had insurance companies. They had the richest concentration of black people in America in 1920. Several of those black folks from Greenwood, Oklahoma, owned their own airplanes. Now you might have wondered what happened. That's for you to find out. I want you to, and today you can find it out. All you got to do is do what? Google it. <laughs> so you can Google it. But I want you to Google it. Hopefully I've uh, raised a little bit of interest in Greenwood, Black Wall Street, Oklahoma. But take a look at it and what happened as part of American history. So the Wall Street Journal in 1920 said, we've been hearing these stories. They sent a reporter out there to Greenwood, Oklahoma. And they confirmed it, said these black folks got cars, they got airplanes, they got their own businesses. There were more millionaires. There were million black millionaires in Greenwood, Oklahoma in 1920. So look at that history. Fast forward. A lot of things happened after Greenwood. And America went back. And this is an important lesson. History's not in a straight line. We don't always get better. It can get worse. 
But what keeps it from getting worse? Leadership. And what keeps it from, what makes it turn around? Leadership. And so imagine as a next sort of seminal event, the 1963 March on Washington. The Civil Rights Movement. First, the Voting Rights Act of 1964. I'm sorry, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Voting Rights Act of 1965. These things were the difference of finally including African Americans in the American dream. They didn't have the right to vote. And those things made a difference, but it took struggle. So next step in this story. With the Civil Rights Movement, you also had about the same time, a little before actually, what was called the Great Migration. Masses of black people, including my family, were leaving the, big, the deep south and coming north and going west. And I can remember the stories of my family and friends from Arkansas. And it all had to do with the transportation system and where you were in the deep south. And so if you were from Mississippi, you ended up in Chicago. If you were from Texas, you ended up in LA. If you were from North Carolina, you ended up in Philadelphia, Washington, Baltimore, New York, and Boston. And I dare say that the black folks in Brockton probably came from the eastern deep south, if you dig back far enough. So you had this movement you had a change in society, and with that movement and that change in society came black political power, primarily in the urban areas. So blacks became mayors, beginning with people like Coleman Young, and, um, and going through, I, I remember when uh, Mayor Washington was elected in Washington, D.C., and Harold Washington in Chicago. Okay. And with that political power came some economic power that created some business opportunity. So when blacks took over City Hall in many of these urban environments, these were businesses. And these, business, these cities borrowed money from Wall Street. And the people that had formerly lent the money to urban governments were Wall Street firms. And those newly elected black mayors from across the North and almost every big city in America, they started ask, some of them started asking questions like, okay, who are we doing business with? And they said, well, you're doing business with Smith Barney and Merrill Lynch and all these other folks, and they said, well, you know what we want? We want to do business with some minority firms that can provide this money. So there was an opportunity there. And there were several black-owned firms that made it on Wall Street as a result of political power and political transition and social change. One of those black men that was in that business of lending money and helping finance governments in the 1970s and in early 1980s was a gentleman by the name of Reggie Lewis. How many of you have heard of that? You, you, Reggie Lewis, there are two Reggie Lewises. There's at least two Reggie Lewises. <laughs> it's, it's such a common name, right? It, it probably, it's probably 15 or 20 Reggie Lewises in Brockton. But Reggie Lewis, the basketball player, of course, from the Boston Celtics, I'm not talking about that Reggie Lewis. I know. I'm talking about Reggie Lewis, who was an entrepreneur. And that Reggie Lewis, he started with a vision of becoming a major owner of a major company. 
And he understood enough about financing. He cut his teeth because there was an opportunity to do business with these cities. And he learned the business. And what he learned about finance and economics and opportunity cost, he used that to do what in the 80s was a very popular sort of financial tool called a leverage buyout. Now, in a leverage buyout, what that means is you don't have enough money to buy what you want to buy, right? Now, black folks and Hispanic folks know about leverage buyouts from a long time ago because we used to put stuff on layaway. <laughs> but Reggie Lewis knew that there were resources to help with the leverage buyout. And what did he do? He bought a billion dollar company that was traded on the New York Stock Exchange. That company was called Beatrice Foods. And so Reggie Lewis was the first African American to own, to be the majority owner, controller of a New York listed company, a listed company on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, unfortunately, Reggie Lewis died prematurely. He died at 50 in 1987. And so, but he created, he, he created a pathway. He said, you can do this. Fast forward, next stop. About that time, you had also the beginning of the supplier diversity movement which I was in intimately involved in. And in supplier diversity, the whole the, the story was there are minority entrepreneurs, black, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, that could grow by doing business with corporations. And all, every corporation that's on, in this room tonight has participated in that movement as a corporate supporter of minority business development. And it wouldn't work without the corporations. MBEs, minority entrepreneurs, learned that that was a path to success. I actually had a presentation, but I didn't want to show it. But there was a couple of pictures I would like to, to have you imagine. Everybody in this room, if I put up a picture of LeBron James, you'd be able to identify LeBron James, right? Does anybody here not know who LeBron James is? You don't know who LeBron is? Could somebody clue her in, please? Now, everybody knows who LeBron James is. Do you guys know how much money LeBron James makes? How much money does LeBron James make? A lot. How much? Anybody know? About $25 million a year. That was his contract in 2016. I don't know what he, that's what he just makes from his NBA contract, $25 million in 2016. I had two pictures of two minority entrepreneurs who made their money in supplier diversity. The first was a woman whose name is Nina Vaca. And you know, if I put her picture up, you wouldn't know her. But Nina Vaca runs a company called the Pinnacle Group. She's out of Texas, a Mexican-American woman. The Pinnacle Group does $500 million a year. Okay? She grew up from humble, a very humble family. No different from the kids in this room. No different. But she had a dream, and she built that company. Look her up. Nina Vaca, the Pinnacle Group. The next picture I had for you was a picture of a gentleman named Dave Stewart. You got anybody here know Dave Stewart? No, nobody knows Dave Stewart. Dave Stewart is the founder and owner of a company called Worldwide Technology. Worldwide Technology, again, owned by Dave Stewart, founded by Dave Stewart in 1990. Dave Stewart's business does eight and a half billion dollars a year. Nobody knows him. I know him. 
Now, Dave Stewart started that business in 1990 with literally a dream. And think about the gumption. You're going to start a business that's called, in 1990, called Worldwide Technology. He is now the biggest buyer of Cisco Systems products in the world. He buys them, he resells them, he fixes them up, he puts them into organizations as large as Apple, as large as the airlines, as large as the major hotels, and he very quietly makes billions and billions a year. Now, I'll do a little math here. LeBron James makes $25 million, which is a lot of money, right? Here's a minority entrepreneur who makes $8 billion. You know the difference between $8 billion and $25 million? Eight, for you, for you, if you pull out your calculator, $8 billion is over 300 times what LeBron James makes. Dave Stewart has a staff of about 5,000 people that work for him. So I told Dave Stewart's assistant that I was coming here tonight. And I told his assistant, who is his senior vice president, and I know Dave, and I'll tell you a story about Dave in a second. But I told him, I said, I'm coming to empower yourself, and I'm going to talk about Dave. But I said, you know, it's going to be some young people in the room. But I know young people. I was, believe it or not, I was once young. <laughs> and I don't think things, some things haven't changed. Young people today, when they see adults, they almost always say, oh, they were always adults. Right? They, they were never kids. They were never stupid like me. <laughs> right? you do, kids do stupid things. We think that you were always this mature person and you always did these things. So I asked, I told her name is Ann Marr, Ann is, her, is Dave's right-hand person. So I said, Ann, what I want is to get a picture of, of Dave when he was 14. He wasn't a billionaire when he was 14. He was just a kid from St. Louis, not too far from Ferguson. That's where he grew up. That's where he made his money. Look him up, Dave Stewart. And I think what you see is a man that was successful, but he looked like you and he looked like me. So the question that was asked earlier, what's the difference? What makes you different? You have, that's a fundamentally important question in life. And for the young people here, you have to answer that question. And don't run away from it. Don't be ashamed of your dreams. Because you can accomplish anything. You know, if Dave Stewart can grow a business in 1990 from nothing, literally nothing, he had no employees. That's the other thing young people think. They see successful people, and they think they were always successful. They started that way. No, that's not how life works. So you take your lumps, but you believe in your dreams, and you can accomplish anything. So with that, thank you very much for having me, Cedric. Thank you, good night. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, to, sorry, no, that was cruel. But um, thank you, Dr. Fred. That was a magnificent speech. It was great having you here. It's great having all of you here. Um, on behalf of the organization, and on behalf of myself especially, I want to thank all of you for being here and for contributing in your own way to the organization and your own way to helping the kids. Um, as, as Dr. Fred said, not everyone that you see that is up at the top or successful got that way by chance. There was work that was put in behind the scenes 
and oftentimes it's work that other people have had to invest. And I am one of the perfect examples of that because as Mrs. Wilders and my parents and a few other people who knew me in the early 2000s might be able to attest to, I was not always the perfect student, the perfect child, the perfect alibi. Um, you know, there was work that they invested in me to help me get to where I am, which is why tonight we really want to honor two people who day in and day out have shown a deep investment not only in the kids, but in forwarding and advancing their potential for the future. And so, well, if the kids want to come up, they can, but I'm going on without them anyway. Um, so it's with great honor that I personally want to invite up Ms. Sharon Wilder, the principal of Brockton High. So, we decided to do this at almost the last second because we realized that, you know, aside from all the members of our board, aside from all the people in our organization who contribute and donate in their own way, you know, there are people who never really get credit behind the scenes for the things that they do. And they really deserve all the credit that they possibly can. So we wanted to award um, the, the first ever Empowered Service Award to Sharon Wolder for her commitment to not only our students, but to the students throughout Brockton High School. Let me just say how incredibly proud I am of the young people who are on this stage with me. Um, really. And at one point, Mr. Turner came in when Michael was in 10th grade and said, you can have him. Because <laughs> he was so upset, and I said, no, no, I'll finish talking to him, and then I'll send him home to you. And Michael has grown up to be an incredible young man. But the young people who are on this stage represent who our kids are in this community. And I think sometimes people forget because they look at the negativity in the newspaper or on the news, or they get this image of Brockton as this horrible place where kids don't achieve. And let me just tell you something. Every day they come to school, they work hard, they represent us well, and they make me very proud. So thank you very much. So we also have a second award here, and unfortunately its recipient had to go home early for a personal emergency. But this award is to Amy Whitaker for her committed service to the students as well, and for helping bring them into Bentley and helping to cultivate our relationship further. And it's really not without her and not without the other representatives of Bentley that you know they're going off to their summer camp and you know, they're offering us a lot in terms of the kids' prospective futures going forward into college. So I would like a Representative Bentley to come up and accept this award on her behalf. No, I'm, I'm not Amy, I'm Claudette Blot. But on behalf of Bentley, this is a privilege for me to take this back to Bentley and to give it to Amy. She works hard. But I love this group as well. And I am looking forward to what they're going to do. I know that there are future business leaders within this group. So thank you for your challenge. So again, on behalf of all of, all of us within Empower Yourself and all of our students and their parents and their families, we want to thank you for coming out tonight. It's not always easy being a dad. Do you have panda asthma too? Does that run in the family? This is the home of the most priceless kung fu artifacts. But when you make an effort... Dad, we're not supposed to touch anything! Oh, sorry. Go along, son! It's always worth it. Whoa! Master! 
the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I am gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more.